Who says it was going to be easy in life? It's not as easy as we thought. Bob Beeman, he was going to be beating Olympic champions. History, it can be very painful from a black point of view. We were not being treated like we were citizens of this country. And so we fought back. And we had to pay a price for it. People were losing their lives. There were conversations about boycotting the Olympics. I think it was just building. They wanted to protest. I felt a need of change, a need of letting people know how we really feel. I felt the consequences would be dire. We had security around us. It's a lot easier to look back and reflect what would I have done differently. I was on a mission. Nothing will stop me from my dream. I was raised and born in New York City, a place called South Jamaica. And so when I got to UTEP, I was not really that knowledgeable of any racial tension at the time. As we traveled and competed in different areas, eventually I caught on to where the tension was coming from. One day we were on our way to uh, Albuquerque and uh, we went in the front door to the restaurant and they said, by no means we serve you in the front you go to the back. To not be served at a restaurant because you're black, that was my first clue that things were not right. Six days of rioting left behind scenes reminiscent of war-torn cities. It took the appearance of 14,000 troops to bring an end to what both Negro and white leaders called insurrection by hoodlums. Any form of opposition tends to provoke a high-tension situation. You an escort, and I'm telling you that. We will define black power. He will listen and recognize it. That's all. That's all. Confrontations were not always peaceful, and marchers were often met with police dogs, fire hoses, and sometimes even murder. This is what you call a painful turn in America. What's it going to be next? We were invited to the New York AC Games. New York AC was going to be the inaugural event in the new Madison Square Garden. Our team was doing extraordinarily well. I had just broke the uh, world record indoors. I was on a mission. And there was a lot of protests about athletes, black athletes competing at the New York AC Games. The New York Athletic Club at the time did not allow blacks, Jewish, or Hispanics to be members in the club. We talked about before if we wanted to go, and everybody was pretty firm on wanting to go. Ray Lump, who was the director of the New York AC Games at that time, said, listen, we understand the pressure. You guys don't want to compete. You guys are taking a chance. If you come to the meet, you're really taking a chance because people got hurt who tried to enter into Madison Square Garden uh, to compete. I mean, there was, there must have been like thousands of people and they had two um, FBI agents with us. We, we had security around us, let us in through some secret passages in Madison Square Garden. It wasn't frightening, but I was really stunned at how this event turned into a very sad story. But we took a stand and we competed. And it probably was not a good idea because it just brought more undue pressure on the athletes. Things were just popping into chaos in terms of what was happening around the country with civil rights. It was getting more intense. That whole period of time was the days of Patty Hearst, Vietnam. A lot of black men were recruited and never came back home fighting a war. We had Muhammad Ali who said that, uh, why should he go to Vietnam and fight? Because these people never did anything to him. And he lost his uh, world championship boxing crown. It was not a good time for us in America. I became 
involved with the civil rights movement, probably January of 68. But I was more in tune to what I wanted to do and where I wanted to see myself. I was always playing sports and I was always placing last place, always looking at those that have won something and always desire to, to find my way up into winning something. And it took a long time to find something that I really love and would be dedicated to. One day I stepped on the long jump pit. I remember that wonderful day that I ran down the runway and I jumped 19 feet on my first jump. And that was enough to win the competition. And so they gave me a medal and I put it on the cap that I wore and I wore it 24 seven. I wore it every day. I was so proud of it. Winning my first medal really pulled me towards track and field. I saw Bob run down the runway one time and I think mentally I said, oh my God. You could just see it on the runway. And then I saw him take off a couple times and the fair jumps were extraordinary, over 25 feet. Watching Bob compete, it was, uh, it was always a thrill because he was so tall and so gangly and so fast that he didn't know what he was gonna be doing with what arm and what leg at one time, but they all came together. He could fly. Pitcher, please. Pitcher, pitcher, please, sir. All right. All right. Thank you much, Mr. Hulu. I'll take a couple of those. You, you, you're doing well. You're yeah, doing thanks. Well. Yeah, I feel good. Feel good for a young man. One of the great things about uh, Coach is that he didn't, he wasn't interested in changing my uh, my style of jumping. He was more interested in what's comfortable, and probably he saw that, wow, that, that's going to get him a long ways. On our way to competing uh, in Austin at the uh, Texas Relays, that was the first time we heard about it. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. The death of Martin Luther King I think affected America in a very sad way that someone who preached non-violence non uh, would have his life ended by being shot. It was chaotic. It was truly an emotional journey from that point on. It just blew up. That's when we, we really started to uh you know, to get together and, and do something about it. As a prelude to the uh, BYU track and field meet. We became more intense with finding a right place to protest and to make our voices heard in some way, in some nonviolent way. I think it was just building, quite frankly, just because of the tension, you know, that was in that period of time. One day we were out on the field talking and I was astounded by the fact that we were getting ready to compete at a university that had certain kinds of feelings about black people. It just made no sense that we should waste our time going to this track meet. We were all aware that there was tension building and that they wanted to protest. And so I, along with 10 other athletes, were sold on the idea that we should let our coach know that we were not going to the track meet. And I was sort of flabbergasted and I reported it to the director of athletics. The athletic director came in and said, we've got a contract with a conference. 
We've got, you know, programs with, everybody has contracts with the school. We need to go and compete. I felt the consequences would be dire. I mean, it just got out of hand. If we didn't participate at Brigham Young, we would lose our scholarships. I mean, we talked about joining them in any other type of protest, whatever they wanted to do, except forfeiture of our scholarships. We, we said we'd do anything, basically, but did not want to take the extra step to just say we're not going at all. That was it. We took the scholarships. We couldn't go near the track or, or the gym, any, anywhere. Of course, I wanted to win a national championship, but principle was very important to me. I think maybe suspension, you know, I, I don't know about revoke, you know, scholarships being revoked. I can't say it wasn't my decision. Uh, I can say that I'm sure that I participated in the conversations. If there is a case for compassion, Dr. Ray said, it would be up to the coach. Nobody is going to tell him what to do. This is a price that no college athletes in this country have ever yet paid for a point on this issue. They are laying down their collegiate athletic lives and they surely knew it. I kind of think that if we did go and the coach really had a hand on it, I think he would have suspended us for a meet or two. You know, I think about whether had we all decided to say we're going to go, we're not going to go at all too, to see if the university would have actually just terminated everybody's scholarship on the entire track program. That would have been the ultimate bluff <laughs> or not. <laughs> but uh, I've thought about whether that would have changed anything. And that was one of the first things that happened in terms of athletics, where we lost our scholarships. And it kind of went away quietly into the sunset. You never, no one really never thought about it or really never knew about these 11 athletes that lost their scholarships. But I continued to do what I set out to do, and that was to make the Olympic team. This is happening on October 18th. I had nothing to think about but jump. My body was on automatic. I stood up at the runway. I'm like pumped up. My heart is like boom, 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 boom. And I'm standing there and I'm looking. I'm, I'm, I'm only looking straight ahead. I'm, I know that the fans are uh, enjoying other events and they're talking and da, 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 but I could not hear one thing only that heart pumping and that my mind was steady looking straight ahead, ready to make my approach to the board. And so as I stood there, they said, it's time to go, boom. My speed was unbelievable. I hit the board. I knew something was rather strange while I was in the air, but basically the jump happened so quickly and I landed. Everybody started to look kind of funny and stuff, you know. Everybody, everybody knew it was a tremendous jump. It's just incredible. You could see it, you know, on the flight, how long he was up in the air. People were just looking like something happened. And, you know, I'm like, okay, let's get this measurement. They had to come in with the manual tape to measure because the jump was too long for the electronic device that they were using to measure the jump. And so Ralph Boston, my teammate, came over to me and he said, Bob, you just broke the record and you just jumped 29 feet. It seemed like I lost consciousness. <laughs> it was like, I heard it, but did I really hear it? I, I, I thought I was in a, I thought I was in a dream. I, I thought I, this is a great dream, you know, this will, this, this is not real. <laughs> um, we were all, you know, exhilar exhilaration. It was just, fan it was just incredible. It all happened at the right time. You know, I found out about Bob winning the, the long jump. We were on a cross country trip and it came over the radio when we were all driving down the highway. I wasn't even there to be there with Bob when it happened. And even to today, as I express what happened to me 54 years ago, 
I always, always feel I gotta, gotta pinch myself and say, Bob, you, you really did do it. It was a moment of perfection, just a moment of perfection. When I was standing up getting my award, my gold medal, I said, you know, I got to leave the next day to come back to El Paso to start school because I was in the middle of October when I came back and, and I had to go straight to class. So that I, I couldn't even enjoy the Olympics the way that I really wanted to. Uh, but when I came back, I got off the plane. Nobody was there to say congratulations. Before the medal ceremony, are you thinking about showing solidarity? I did, I wore my black socks. I wore them for Martin Luther King. I wore them for Malcolm X. I wore them for Bobby Kennedy. I wore them for John J.F. Kennedy. I wore them for all of y'all. I think what the 11 of us did was a breaking ground of consciousness for the conference, for sports in general around the country in terms of athletics in universities, colleges, and junior colleges. It made people more aware. We made a big difference 